Uh, the next speaker will be Herr Fahi. Let's start. Okay, so uh, I know we're running a little late. I actually took uh, Virginie's uh, request to keep my talk down to 10 minutes to heart. So I moved several slides out of the presentation. So hopefully we can make up a little time. So uh, at Intervene Immune, we're focused on restoring immune system function and reversing epigenetic aging in humans. So our goal is kind of symbolized by this photograph as we go from left to right in the photograph, that's what we're trying to do. And I, uh, I borrowed that uh, photograph from a cover of Life magazine. So we focus on clinical trials because humans are the best model of uh, human aging intervention. And uh, <clears throat> it used to be that this is a real problem, uh, partly because in order to find out if your aging intervention worked or not, you had to wait for everybody to die and then see if lifespan was extended, but we don't have to wait. Uh, for that anymore because people like uh, Steve Horvath in particular and other people who have been inspired by him uh, have come up with uh, global measurements of aging that are pretty good uh, biological surrogates of, of aging in general. So we can use those kinds of endpoints to measure aging in humans and find out if an intervention is working. And uh, as you just heard from Irina and also from Brian, there are now interventions that are safe enough and promising enough to try in humans and so that's what we're, we're doing. And uh, you can study rats uh, your whole life, but uh, I think it's time to move on to humans because there's really no time to lose. We're all aging at a high rate and many other people are as well, of course, and they need our help. So our focus has been on the thymus, uh, which as you all know, is the master gland of the immune system. It generates uh, T cells uh, that are important for fighting off uh, cancer cells and invading bacteria and viruses. And uh, unfortunately, the thymus involutes are, uh, starting around the time of puberty. And this has a delayed effect such that uh, somewhere between the ages of 60 and uh, 80, we lose about 98% uh, of our ability to, uh, to recognize foreign antigens. Uh, and as a result of that, we lose immune system effectiveness over time. And um, just as we fall off the cliff uh, on the left, we climb up this other uh, curve uh, in the middle, which uh, signifies a risk of death. So risk of death uh, tends to double uh, within two years uh, if, if your immune system is failing. Now this is, uh, the significance of this has escaped people for many decades because the effect is so uh, distant uh, in time from the cause. The thymic involution happens around uh, 12 or, or so at least begins there but your immune system doesn't collapse until you're 65. But now we're all quite familiar with the importance of the immune system because of COVID-19 in which you see that if you're over 80, uh, your risk of dying of this disease is uh, more than 100 times greater than your risk if you're 10. And the reason for that is obviously because your immune system has aged. The good news about all of this is that involution of the thymus is developmentally programmed. In other words, it's caused by specific biochemical factors and therefore those factors can be altered and uh, used to reverse uh, thymic involution. Um, although it's possible that maybe something like Irene has been working on could have some effect on the immune system. In general, uh, the thymus involution problem arises because of something that happens in youth. And so targeting aging is not gonna really address the thymic involution problem. It has to be addressed sp specifically. And that's why we think uh, you know, what we're trying to do is relevant to combating aging. So we saw an opportunity to regenerate the thymus based on both animal and uh, diseased human studies. What you see on the left is uh, uh, some of the results presented by Kelly uh, uh, et al. in 1986 in PNAS, showing that uh, implanting cells that produce growth hormone uh, led to re rejuvenation, both of the structure of the thymus and also the function of the thymus. Um, and uh, in the middle, you see uh, a human study that was published in 2008 by Laura Napolitano, who was involved in treatment of HIV. And uh, they gave growth hormone to their HIV patients and showed even within six months that they could demonstrate thymic regeneration based on CT imaging and that this help to replete the depleted uh, naive CD4 and CD8 uh, cell populations. 
In terms of normal people, uh, and that's what our goal is, we want to apply this kind of technology to normal aging, not to some kind of disease model. Um, that's my thymus in the upper right, uh, before and after just a month uh, on growth hormone therapy. And you can see an increase in dark mass uh, indicated by the arrow, which is uh, presumably uh, an increase in, in thymic uh, functional mass, which is demonstrably uh, more than two standard deviations above the mean and therefore uh, a true sign of uh, thymic uh, regeneration uh, in my cells. So based on all of that, we uh, started this trial called the TRIM trial, which stands for thymus regeneration, immunorestoration, and insulin mitigation. Uh, we treated uh, men uh, who were 65 uh, years of age or less uh, with a growth hormone uh, between, the eight, between uh, 2015 and 2017. We published results in 2019. This was a uh, pilot feasibility, safety, and dose uh, ranging study. Uh, we wanted to see if we could regrow the thymus just before the age at which the immune system collapses so we could rescue people from falling off that immunological cliff. Um, we used MRI uh, quantitation of thymic fat content thanks to protocols developed for us at Stanford uh, University, which is where the trial was based. We were able to uh, collaborate with Steve Horvath at UCLA um, with the University of British Columbia to ensure that we could measure epigenetic aging in our uh, volunteers. Um, and uh, the treatment lasted for one year, was done under an IND from the FDA, it was IRB approved. Um, and by the way, we only had nine guys in the trial, which is a weakness of the trial, but you'll see that we got robust results anyway. Uh, the, the core of the treatment is use of recombinant human growth hormone as a thymotrophic agent. It's given by injection four times a week uh, using a special injection uh, device that has uh, growth hormone cartridges that go into it. The manufacturer does not make uh, placebo cartridges, so it was actually not possible to have a placebo control for growth hormone in the study. Uh, the other component of the treatment was two anti-hyperinsulinemic agents, DHA and metformin. We use those because uh, growth hormone administration elevates insulin levels. Insulin is a pro-aging factor and you don't wanna raise it. Uh, so reference points there in, in the Napolitano 2008 HIV study shows that in, in her dose range, you expect to see a large increase in insulin but uh, I published in uh, 2010 the fact that DHEA administration can reverse the hyperinsulinemic effect of growth hormone. So that was one of the components of our cocktail. It's advantageous also because it, uh, uh, DHEA declines with aging. So replacing it has a certain rationale and the depletion of DHEA with aging is associated with the increased all cause mortality and various age related uh, problems. The second component is metformin, obviously, uh, it increases insulin sensitivity, so it will tend to combat this hyperinsulinemic effect. Uh, uh, the Spindler lab showed that it's a very good uh, calorie restriction mimetic, and you'll hear a lot more about metformin and its virtues uh, from your Barzilai's presentation. Suffice it to say, we thought it was a strategic agent to use to block the side effect of growth hormone. So what did we see? Uh, First of all, we did see uh, radiological evidence for uh, thymic uh, regeneration. On the left, you see a fairly white looking thymus, uh, which is mostly fat, uh, becoming a much grayer. In other words, the fat content is being replaced with functional mass. And as you can see in the middle, the probability uh, associated with that change was highly statistically significant. We also looked at uh, sternal bone marrow uh, fat content as a control. And we found that that also uh, improved uh, by about 30%, uh, again, with high statistical significance, which is relevant because bone marrow function is important for aging and for thymus regeneration and for immune repletion. In terms of immunological effects, we saw uh, uh, recent thymic uh, emigrants uh, uh, begin to come back. Uh, we also saw a repletion of naive CD4 and CD8 T cells. We also uh, saw a reduction in exhausted CD8 cells is indicated uh, by this marker PD-1, which has an additional point of significance about it, which is that PD-1 is a checkpoint inhibitor and lowering PD-1 ought to improve the body's ability to recognize and combat cancer. 
So other results included, uh, uh, for example, a higher lymphocyte to monocyte ratio, which uh, uh, independent studies have linked to uh, improved outcomes for at least 18 kinds of cancer and various age-related conditions, which are listed. Um, uh, and, let, and along the bottom, you see that uh, our treatment uh, lowered inflammation, at least as uh, measured by uh, CRP levels. Uh, it reduced uh, prostate cancer risk based on PSA scoring. Uh, it increased FGF21, which is not only a, a thymotrophic factor, but also extends longevity of mice. It also improved kidney function, evidently. Uh, and we, uh, we accomplished all of this without uh, too much of a problem with insulin. Uh, insulin did go up a bit, but we're, we stayed within, uh, well within the normal range. Uh, interestingly enough, we weren't expecting this, but some of our guys had their hair start to grow in dark again. Uh, so next time we do the study, uh, we're going to have to pay more attention to that. The thing that caught a lot of people's attention was uh, that we also found that epigenetic aging seemed to be reversed by our treatment. Uh, across uh, the top, you see four different aging clock results, the original Horvath DNA methylation clock, uh, uh, Levine's phenol age clock, the Hanum clock and then this uh, more uh, recent grim age clock. Uh, and as you can see in all cases, the uh, change was uh, highly significant. Uh, and and the, uh, so the Hanum clock and particularly the grim age clock, it, the, the change was permanent. Uh, six months after we discontinued treatment, we did not see any uh, reduction in this improved uh, epigenetic age based on grim age or, or Hanum age. Uh, and that's significant because grim age is a predictor of human lifespan. So we saw about a 2.2 year reduction in grim age, which would predict the 2.2 year increase in life expectancy. Of course, uh, we don't have any substantiation for that, but it's an interesting observation. The average of all of these clocks is shown in the lower uh, left and the turquoise points. Uh, and if you look at the slopes of the lines, uh, it seems that epigenetic aging reversal accelerated greatly between nine and 12 months of treatment. So up to nine months, we were regressing epigenetic age about 1.5 times faster than chronological uh, time was, was going by. Uh, but uh, in the last three months, we were regressing epigenetic age uh, at the rate of about six and a half years of epigenetic aging reversal for every one year of treatment. Uh, this uh, uh, reminds me of this concept of Aubrey Gray's of longevity escape velocity, which with normal aging, you get uh, one year older after a year, but if you can achieve longevity escape velocity, you either don't get older or you get younger. And we're firmly in the younger camp. Uh, you know, the guys ended up the trial on average one and a half years younger epigenetically than when they started or two and a half years younger than if they had done nothing. So we're going to follow up on this trial. As I said, we only had nine guys in the trial. Uh, trim X, which is the extension of the trim trial, will have, we hope, somewhere between 70 and 100 uh, volunteers. We'll include women, minorities, um, and an expanded age range, anywhere from 40 to 80 years of age. Uh, we're going to have some groups that uh, use growth hormone and some groups that don't, so we can parse out what the effect of growth hormone is uh, with respect to all of these results. Uh, we also uh, hope to uh, have uh, an untreated control group that will control for the effect of metformin and DHEA. We hope to include some key cell functional uh, assays. We're presently seeking uh, uh, grant support to underwrite some of the costs of the trial. But one of the things that we hope to get out of this trial, uh, speaking about biomarkers, is epigenetic aging reversal as an FDA approvable endpoint which would benefit not only our own progress, but also everybody else who's able to reverse epigenetic aging by any means that they may apply. So in summary, um, it looks to us, at least based on our preliminary results, that epigenetic aging reversal and reversal of immunosenescent trends appears to be possible in, in humans now. And uh, we hope to uh, re begin reproducing and extending these trials uh, very soon and, and investigating uh, mechanisms underlying the effects that we saw. And uh, that's our contact information at the bottom if anyone has any questions. So thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for your interesting lecture.
Uh, I think we can have maybe uh, a question. Um, let's see what's all we have here. Uh, um, So, yeah, so someone asked, since the time is in, in volutes quite early in life, but the T-cell reservoir stays strong until the age of about 60, are there compensatory mechanisms taking place in the meantime? There are, yes, there are compensatory mechanisms. Uh, there's a lot of uh, T-cell uh, division that takes place in the periphery to maintain T-cell levels. However, it's only partially compensatory because uh, that happens at the expense of genetic diversity of those T cells. Eventually, you run out of um, uh, uh, epigenetic, uh, uh, I'm using the wrong word, you run out of uh, T cell receptor repertoire. In other words, the versatility of the, of the immune system, the ability to recognize antigens goes down, and that's what that immune cliff was. Uh, but yes, uh, that you can save that off for quite a long time because you actually have the ability to recognize quite a large number of antigens when you're young, you can lose a lot of that before it starts affecting our mortality and morbidity. But uh, if you look at the uh, change in susceptibility to, uh, to uh, COVID uh, and look at the change in susceptibility to death in general, uh, uh, they match up pretty well. So uh, we think that uh, immune dysfunction creeps up on you uh, from the beginning, it just gets worse and worse, uh, but the but the real real major impact is, is seen later in life. Okay, uh, and Jos asked, what do you think about Fox and one uh, therapies for the timers? Yeah, we think that we're activating Fox and one with our treatment. Uh, there are various signs of that. If you look at the the, the uh, way. Fox and one affects the thymus and the way our treatment affects the thymus, they seem to be very similar. And Fox and one uh, might be predicted to do things like uh, induce uh, repigmentation of hair, which is one of the symptoms that we saw. So uh, yes, Fox and one uh, gene therapy would be nice eventually, but as you know, that's a very long road and we all need something right now. Uh, we'd like to get there eventually, but uh, for right now, we think we're getting there uh, indirectly uh, using these more normal physiological approaches. Okay, thank you very much. And there are some more questions in the chat, so you can answer them there. Thank you for your interesting lecture.